Taiwan has been out of reach for China for over half a century. But with ever-growing Chinese strength, the Taiwanese might one day find themselves faced with an overwhelmingly powerful adversary. But this video isn't about whether Taiwan could defend itself. That question depends on too many outside factors, like political alliances and overall geopolitical climate. What this video will do is explore Taiwanese armed forces, what they excel at and what they lack in. Taiwan is a fairly small island, only slightly bigger in area than Maryland, for example, and smaller than Switzerland. Yet it is densely packed, with 23 million souls living there. Across the Taiwan Strait lies mainland China. What separates the two is some hundred or so miles of sea. That area is a buffer that protected Taiwan all these decades. It's the reason why an attack on Taiwan would have to be multi-staged and multifaceted, complex and not to be pulled off quickly, which all means that Taiwan would have some time to put its defenses in place. Taiwan, much like Israel, Singapore or Finland or Switzerland, is a country geared to mobilize its military potential quickly, as upkeeping a vast military through peacetime is simply not sustainable economically. The active duty part of the armed force numbers some 160,000 men. To put that in context, the US active duty military numbers 1.3 million. The Chinese active duty military is even higher at a cool 2 million. A higher figure for Taiwan is sometimes cited. In theory, the Taiwanese plan to upkeep 215,000 military and civilian personnel. But there are budgetary issues of actually getting that many people under contract. So many Taiwanese units are understaffed, sometimes at just 80% of their ideal staff numbers. A bigger part of the said Taiwanese figure serve in the army, but as keeping the waters in the strait clear of Chinese ships is of utmost importance, it's understandable that the Navy and Air Force combined form close to half of the overall Taiwanese military. Conscription was for many decades a way to upkeep the numbers, but for a decade now, new conscripts, those born after 1994, serve only a four-month term. Actual long-term plans call for complete removal of conscription, though the timetable for that has been put on hold, as there simply aren't enough candidates for professional soldiers to be wooed by the budget allocated for them. That being said, the majority of Taiwanese soldiers are professional soldiers, with conscript numbers reaching a few tens of thousands. There have been issues reported with the quality of training those conscripts get. Most of the training saw soldiers just wasting time in local barracks. That is changing now, as conscripts will be shipped to integrate with actual professional army units for a brief period, so they can learn from that experience. The reservist force doesn't train much either. Most of them are called upon every two years for a refresher course. It usually lasts five days, which is when compared to some other countries like Singapore, Finland or the US, quite inadequate. The plan is for Taiwan to increase the refresher training to two weeks every year from 2022 onward. But to see the fruits of that change in actual capability levels, some years will still need to pass. Taiwan's reservists are in total quite numerous. Military reserves are usually estimated to be between 1.5 and 2.5 and million troops. Various civilian duty reservists, like search and rescue, firefighters, medical staff and so on, number an additional 1 million. A small subset of reservists serve in brigades kept at high readiness, which have one of their three maneuver battalions composed of active duty soldiers. More reservists serve in brigades which have only the top level command composed of active duty troops. Mobilization of such units would take longer. Then there are reservists within the home defense units. Those have no active duty personnel. Those would take by far the longest to train. And heavy weapons such as artillery are not numerous enough that all of those units would receive them. The chief of the Taiwanese Defense Mobilization Office was quoted saying that his office can mobilize 215,000 reservists within 24 hours, with another 78,000 placed on standby. But that refers only to people entering the system. As said, the majority will need weeks and some even longer to be trained to satisfactory levels. Also, there simply isn't enough heavy armaments available for most of the reservist units. Even some of the listed structured reserve units 
would have to rely on mortars instead of howitzers, and the vast, vast majority of the 2 million strong mobilization potential would be very light infantry units, equipped basically with just rifles and, at best, some rocket-propelled grenade launchers. Also, those unstructured reserves would be so lacking in military experience that they would need months of training to be an even remotely effective force. Why does Binko focus on the reserves so much? Because the active duty part of the military may simply not survive long enough as a functioning counter to a possible Chinese invasion. Part of that is due to the proximity of Taiwan to mainland China. China can simply afford to project firepower over the strait. But part of Taiwan's focus is due to the relatively low number of active duty forces, and in certain areas even low quality equipment. So high reservist numbers are the best means of countering China. Almost all those reservists would be there to augment the army, which in its active duty form is not that big. The tank force is quite old, made up of tanks designed 50 or more years ago. Those have been modernized of course. The CM-11 is essentially an advanced M48A5 with modern sights. The CM-12 is an M60 with an advanced M48 turret. But all those are still marching towards obsolescence with their 105mm guns and fairly weak armor. And even the sights aren't top of the line anymore. The gun may be adequate, as their typical targets would be landing boats and lightly armored vehicles on the beaches. But the armor may not withstand the current threats in the form of standoff missiles and bombs. Taiwan is in the process of getting some Abrams tanks, but the first small-scale deliveries will start next year with the 108th, the last vehicle, to arrive in 2026. Mechanized brigades rely on the CM-32 family of vehicles, basically a typical modern wheeled infantry fighting vehicle. Various sub-variants exist. Some active units still have to rely on the CM-21 though, which is basically the M113 APC that's been up-armored. Again, there are various sub-variants, such as mortar or anti-tank missile carrier variants. Some 300 simple V-150 Commando APC vehicles are also in use, as are 70 amphibious assault APCs. The indigenous CM-32 family is a good replacement for the fairly light M113 family, and the focus on a wheeled platform is understandable, as fast reaction times and ease of maintenance may be of greater importance to the Taiwanese, as opposed to tactical mobility that tracked vehicles offer. Taiwan is expected to keep enemies pinned to the shores and not let them amass heavy weapon systems. Artillery is extremely important for Taiwan to defend its shores, so it's no wonder it's got more artillery pieces per active duty soldier than either the US or China. There's a wide variety of guns available, with some being stored for the reservists. The Thunder 2000 multiple rocket launcher is perhaps their most potent weapon, with some of its munitions capable of covering a wide area with steel projectiles upon detonation, from 30 miles away, tailored against disembarking enemy troops. The M109 Paladin Howitzer, however, is equally important, being armored and thus at least somewhat protected against enemy artillery barrage and airstrikes. Taiwan has recently signed a contract for US-made HIMARS, including short-range ballistic missiles for them, but all those will complete delivery only by 2027. Another area where Taiwan is pretty heavily armed are vehicle and soldier-launched missiles. While usually called anti-tank guided missiles, most of Taiwan's targets would likely be landing boats and craft and various light and medium armored vehicles. The list shown encompasses the last 30 years of Taiwan's procurements. Further javelins and Taos are contracted. Would such numbers be enough is anyone's guess, as certainly some would never survive to get launched and many would be spoofed or mistargeted. But to get to the phase of the fight on the beaches, first the Taiwanese Navy would have to seize operations, which is a plausible outcome, as the Navy is perhaps the least funded of Taiwan's branches. That's on purpose, of course, as the Navy can't possibly match the Chinese out in the open seas so a large navy would be a liability, not an asset. Though as a vestige of the 1990s and times when the Chinese navy wasn't as capable, Taiwan's navy still mostly relies on the large ships it got in that era. The designs its navy uses mostly stem from the 1970s and 80s. 
the French Lafayettes, were built in the 1990s. While those ocean-going ships were of course modernized, they're still a force that would likely need to keep to the shores and rely on the protection of other coastal and airborne assets. The four Kid-class destroyers are perhaps the most important, as they add to the overall SAM umbrella of the whole of Taiwan. The newest ship Taiwan has is the Tuochiang missile boat. Small but packed with sensors and weapons, approaching capabilities of a corvette. Taiwan is however building them quite slowly, those will be replacing the older missile boats. The last line of defense are Kuanghua small missile boats, built in large numbers. Being tiny, they're basically just fast-going missile launchers. The Taiwanese Navy actually uses some fairly large landing ships, but it's questionable if those would survive to supply or free various non-mainland islands around Taiwan. The submarine force is hopelessly small. Out of four submarines, only two are somewhat modern, while two were built in the 1940s. Despite modernization, such subs are highly ineffective for anything but laying mines or sitting silent and hoping prey will stumble in front of them. Aerial patrol and anti-submarine platforms are also present, though their numbers and ability to survive long enough are questionable. Perhaps a more important asset would be truck-based anti-ship missile launchers, coupled with radar vehicles. An unknown number, though possibly approaching 100 trucks, is deployed by Taiwan, using the domestically developed Xiong Feng 2 and 3 missiles. The former is roughly an early Harpoon equivalent, while the latter is a larger supersonic missile. Those missile types are also heavily used by Taiwanese ships, though US procured Harpoon missiles are increasing in numbers as well. While modern anti-ship missiles often have secondary land strike capabilities via satellite guidance, Taiwan also has dedicated missiles for that. A Tomahawk-class cruise missile as well as a medium-range ballistic missile. Such missiles, coupled with Air Force's weapons, could disrupt various ops on the other side of the strait, like activities in ports and air bases. But the sheer number of targets in China compared to the number of Taiwanese missiles may result in limited effects on targets. Especially the subsonic missile may be inadequate against layered Chinese air defenses. The Air Force's Wan Qian missile could also be useful though its capabilities are limited by its small size and questionable prospects of survival through the Chinese air defenses. Speaking of air defenses, that's the area that's perhaps the most important for Taiwan. For as long as Taiwan can deny air superiority to China, ground targets in Taiwan may be somewhat protected, including its beaches. There is quite a layered SAM network in Taiwan. The oldest system is the US-sourced Hawk, which is gradually being retired. Taiwan had developed the Tiankung SAM system. Curiously, some of the Tiankung systems feature fixed sight batteries, which, while they made sense against China in the 1990s, are quite a liability today against guided weapons. Tiankung 3 is more advanced and also has some anti ballistic missile capability. As Taiwan developed its own systems, Taiwan also purchased Patriot SAM batteries from the US. The Pac 3 is an especially worthy addition given its anti-ballistic missile capabilities. Still, overall anti-ballistic missile protection is lacking given the sheer number of threats. The Pac-3 can deal with large MRL rockets and even some Chinese missiles like DF-11, and Tiankang-3 may be able to deal with some larger ballistic missiles. But if Taiwan finds itself in a situation where thousands of various missiles rain in its territory within just weeks, in addition to hundreds of enemy planes overflying it each day, its SAM defenses may be simply inadequate. As mentioned before, Taiwanese Navy ships would add to area air defenses, but it's questionable how long those would survive. Short-range SAMs using infrared-guided missiles are also plentiful, which would be important against low-flying planes and especially helicopters. The Taiwanese Air Force is a curious beast. Here's the problem. While ships may afford to spend weeks away from a port, planes need even more infrastructure daily for every mission. Various depots and hangars in Taiwan are hardened and even hidden in mountain tunnels, but runways would still be constantly attacked. Every little bit of highway that could be used as a provisional runway would also get bombarded over and over again. Those are perhaps the Achilles heel of the Taiwanese defenses. No matter how strong the Air Force might be, 
actual usefulness of the overall force and number of missions performed per day may be quite limited. The tip of the spear is formed by the F-16 modernized to be roughly equal to the Block 70. The entire fleet is expected to be modernized in two years' time. The Mirage 2000 fighters are also potent, though aimed primarily at air combat. The indigenous FCK-1 are a bit smaller, but still capable as they've been modernized. Lastly, some 40-ish near obsolete F-5 airframes complete the fleet. Those will retire in the coming years, as Taiwan will receive 66 newly built F-16Vs to be delivered by 2026. The thing is, all those planes, except the modernized F-16s, are showing their age. They can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chinese fighters that would likely be tasked to fly over Taiwan. Going on offensive missions against China would be mostly suicidal. So the real mission of Taiwanese Air Force is to somewhat survive on the ground and to use up any opportunity when a runway surface is operational to harass the attackers. Basically, it would be a losing battle, similar to the Navy's mission. The only question being how long could the harassment go on and how much of the enemy's force could be destroyed in the process. So part of the Taiwanese defense issue is geographical. Their potential enemy is just so close. Their own homeland is tiny and very crowded, especially once the mountains are excluded. There's just not much rear area left for various artillery and air force units to regroup. Part of the issue is economic. Taiwan isn't a terribly rich country. Its GDP is nominally 1 20th of the Chinese. Purchasing parity-wise it's better, but Taiwan is procuring most of its arms from the US at US export prices, so that doesn't help it much. Its defense spending is also roughly 20 times smaller than China's, given that China spends more than its official budget. Taiwan is trying to slowly raise its defense spending. The long-term goal is 3% of its GDP. Right now it's at 2.3%. And there doesn't seem to be much room for improvement. Taiwan's population is quickly aging and has basically stopped growing. The total fertility rate is amongst the worst in the world which means that pumping money into double the defense expenditure is simply not an option, as the whole economy is being pressured by the aging population as it is. Back in the 1980s when Taiwan's GDP was surging, the defense budget to GDP ratio was actually higher. So it's evident that Taiwan is having a hard time upkeeping both a high-tech and numerous navy and air force, upkeeping a large force to be mobilized once the potential enemy disembark onto its land is the only real way to defend itself, unless outside parties decide to join the fight. Those mobilized forces, however, may find themselves poorly equipped for the most part. The numbers will in theory be there. Two million well-equipped, skilled and dedicated warriors would surely be able to fight off the invader. But aside from questionable equipment, other questions remain. Just how skilled and experienced will most of those defenders be? and even their dedication may in part be questioned. Media polls in Taiwan paint an inconclusive picture when the matter of willingness to fight against China is raised. A recent saber rattling has led to a bit more Taiwanese saying they would indeed join the army and fight, but ultimately it's something that won't be known for certain until the big war happens, which hopefully may not be unavoidable. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.